Well, one of Nintendo's best studios is rapidly expanding and working on their game engine for future titles. And of course, that includes games coming to Nintendo Switch 2 because this is Nintendo's own internal studio. One of their largest internal studio that has credits in so many of Nintendo's biggest games, you would almost think this has become a quintessential part of Nintendo of Japan's development cycle. But it's really interesting when we look at this interview that was conducted with a massive team member at Monolith Soft talking about a brand new department that they are opening at the company and what that department does and how it's going to make their games and the games they're involved in even better. Oh man, this is some pretty exciting stuff, especially when we get some direct quotes coming from Nintendo employees. That being said, everyone, uh, I want to thank you so much for being here. If you're enjoying this news, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Drop a like on this video. Go down to the comments below and let me know what is your favorite project that either Monolith Soft has made, like internally, you know, like Xenoblade kind of games, or your favorite game in which they were involved in. Remember, they've been involved with Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, several others. In fact, we'll put a link down below that shows you like the full list of of credits that Monolith Soft has to their name. Now, we're going to first head over to Nintendo Life, even though this isn't where the interview took place. We're going to use their interpretation of the interview, and then later in the video, we'll actually read the interview through a AI translation, because it was in Japan, uh, just to give you guys additional context. So, first, let's go over here and look at Monolith Soft. So Monolith Soft is expanding its in-house Xenoblade game engine for future titles, and it has landed on a new research and development division. So, Monolith Soft, the studio behind Xenoblade Chronicles series is expanding its in-house engine for use on future titles thanks to its newly founded R&D department. Thanks Automation. That's who they got this from. This is according to the company's chief creative officer, Tetsuya Takahashi, and lead programmer, Michihiko Inaba, who, in a recent interview with Japanese outlet CG World, spoke about the company's plans for the future as it plans to tackle bigger development projects. According to Inaba, the currently in development engine is based on one the company created for 2010's Xenoblade Chronicles. That was all the way back on Wii, guys. Uh, anyways, with the goal being one day to have it fully managed by the internal research and development team. For the time being, several different development teams are working on the engine's modeling and effect technologies before all are compiled into the finished project. Despite the difficulties of maintaining an in-house engine, Takashi believes it will be worthwhile. Quote, we don't really have the option of using engines made by other companies, he told CEG World. This is because in-house engines are easier to customize to suit our needs and are easier to use. Now, according to Takahashi, Monolith Soft has wanted an internal R&D department for years, though it had too few employees to make it happen without detracting from the development team. That was until the company started working with Nintendo. Quote, as the scale of development became larger, the level of demand for development also increased. Now, these increasing demands led to an increase in workforce and, in turn, room for an R&D team. The new department, helmed by Inaba, aims to streamline the development process, support to development, and research slash development new technologies, all of which seem like solid choices of the company looks to future titles. As for what the company's future holds, well, I'll just have to wait and see. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 landed in 2022, yada, yada, yada. So that's some pretty exciting stuff there. I mean, look, the idea that they're going to use an internal, uh, you know, they're, they're going to bring all of their their stuff internally is not really surprising i i think it's i think it's the right move i maybe they got that idea by you know working on tears of the kingdom working on breath of the wild watching nintendo have an in-house developed uh you know engine and how that actually can work and apply to uh, creating something that just is not as easily capable to be done in other engines there are a lot of pitfalls of using internal engines they're very expensive you have to maintain them yourself but the benefits are you can actually take full advantage of what you're trying to do for your given technology you're making for whether it's a switch or switch 2 or whatever target specs you're aiming for because you don't need to have all the outside fluff for technologies that just don't exist or just aren't part of your purview. Now, here's where the actual interview came from. So we're going to go over and look at this. It's going to feel a little bit repetitive, but I, I like to add this context in when we can. Uh, this comes from CGWorld.jp. It says, establishing a system capable of withstanding large-scale development and pursuing more original expression, Monolith Soft aim at establishing a new R&D division and the talent it is looking for. Now, remember, this is being translated uh, by Google. So, you know, the translations are never going to be exact, but it's going to give us a really good idea here. So this is from... Uh, 
uh, CG World asking them today. I would like to talk about the R&D team that was established at Monolith Soft. First, please briefly tell us about the roles of Takahashi and Inaba with the R&D team. So Takahashi says, As director of Monolith Soft, I not only manage the company, but also oversee the development site. I've also been in charge of overseeing the R&D team for about a year now. Uh, this is where Anaba comes in. I was originally a programmer, and at Monolith Soft, I was in charge of programming the drawing engine for the Xenoblade series. I was a dedicated programmer until Xenoblade Chronicles 3, but after that, I took on the role of producer and director of the R&D team. So it really seems like, you know, if, if we think about this, it kind of feels like, yeah, well, they had this engine they were using and just kind of modifying over time. They didn't have a full R&D team until right around the time Xenoblade Chronicles 3 wrapped up. That's when Inaba started heading the team and started really taking it in new directions. So we haven't really seen anything from the team since Inaba took over and that's important because the R&D team is kind of the small sort of off to the side thing if it even existed at all just a couple people now it seems like they have a full dedicated team which is only going to make their engine even better so as we get back to the interview here see uh, CGW here says uh, next will you tell us about the background and purpose of the R&D team Takahashi says although we launched the R&D team we had been working on R&D even before that Monolith Soft is a developer so we do not have the manpower leeway compared to publishers uh, publishers can easily hire personnel and challenge R&D as a company asset. But in our case, since title development is the main focus, we did not have much manpower leeway for the future investment. We were developing Xenoblade Chronicles 2 in 2017. We only had a few dozen in-house programmers, and we were overwhelmed with development alone. We were not in position to organize an R&D team. So as you're seeing there, he's just openly admitting, hey, you know, when we were making Xenoblade Chronicles 2, didn't have an R&D team. We didn't have enough developers in-house to really do that. So it's very important this r d stuff is new for them but it's also very important and you're going to see that here in a moment so uh, cgw says so that was the situation at the time tagashi the situation continued for a while so even past xenobate chronicles 2 that's why i said xenobate chronicles 3 didn't really have the benefit of the R&D team. But then we started development titles with Nintendo that would be enjoyed by tens of millions of customers around the world. Of course, you're talking about Zelda, right? Tens of millions of customers. And as the scale of development became larger, the level of demand for development also increased. Takahashi then goes on to say, so it's no longer the era where you can do it with a small number of people. We thought that we can't rely on human wave tactics forever and felt that we needed to create an organization that would approach development from a technical perspective to reduce the amount of work required and improve efficiency. That's why we decided to launch the R&D team. CGW says, what kind of people did you gather on the team when you first started? And Naba goes, we gather staff who are basically technically strong, TAs, such as people who can write scripts, people who are good at rigging, and people who can use Houdini. We also have programmers who are knowledgeable about building development environments and implementing drawing systems. CGW goes, do those people transfer from the in-house development team to the R&D team? Takahashi goes, originally, we had a department in charge of TA-like work, and we expanded that. First, we asked Anaba, the head programmer, to join us, and then we transferred TAs and programmers who were involved in the title development at the Tokyo office, uh, and we originally increased the number of members. CGW says, how many people do you have on the team in the future? Or do you want to have on the team in the future? And Naba goes, it's difficult to give a specific number, but the more the better. Given the scale of development we do and the rapid turnover of game technology and information in recent years, we want to create an organization that can respond flexibly and quickly. So CGW then you know, shifts focus here and says, hey, please tell us more about the role of the R&D team. So Anaba goes, the R&D team has three roles. This is important to remember for what this R&D team at Monolith Soft is doing streamlining the development environment for the entire company so making just easier to make games supporting tool development for each section and researching and developing new technologies it goes on to go until now each team prepared their own tools so in-house tools such as the jenkins environment dcc tools and data converters were duplicated the first role is to consolidate and manage these in the r d team the second role is to consolidate the and centralize the in-house tools within the company and develop tools in the r d team and provide support to each section although it's difficult with the current size of the team we still think it's important to develop tools here the third role research and development of new technology includes not only research and development of each elemental technology but also the actual implementation of those technologies in particular, we would like to focus on research and development related to drawing, lighting, and animation. We also learn about excellent development cases from other companies, document them in the R&D team, and share them with 
the company. So CGW, this is, I imagine the team members that are assigned to each task, such as the animation related task or development tools for the designers. How do you manage the teams for each task? And novice says there is a dedicated team leader for each task, and they are basically in charge of the management. However, in order to allow the team leaders to focus on practical work, support such as scheduling and document preparation is handled by the R and D teams PM. So, uh, CGW says, I heard the R and D team is currently working on the three main research and development projects, uh, support for the development in-house drawing development research and the future tools and designers. First, please tell us the details of the first in-house engine development. So this is where things get really interesting. We learn how their in-house development has progressed. So Anava says the in-house engine we are currently developing was originally developed for Xenoblade Chronicles in 2010, and we are still expanding it. Eventually, we'd like the R&D team to fully manage this in-house engine. But at present, since there are many members of the title development section, we are creating various necessary drawings and effect expressions in the form of support and joint development. In the future, we will integrate the developed technology as an in-house engine so that it can be used in other titles. It has only been about a year since the R&D team was established. So again, this is literally at the end, like Xenoblade Chronicles 3 came out, and then they put this team together. So we plan to gradually transition the system over the next three years or so. So what he's essentially saying is that, well, they had this engine they sort of rough cobbled together for Xenoblade back in the day. It was a combination of other game engines and their own in-house stuff. They've just kind of been slowly like modifying it on a game-by-game -game basis since then. And he's kind of like, that's just a really sloppy way to handle things. We're still trying to bring that engine in-house and then try to like fully overhaul and, and, and reimagine imagine what that engine is to make it more efficient and better for future releases. This is something that's going to take a lot of time because, again, they kind of cobbled this whole thing together over the years with a very small team. Uh, so uh, as you see here, CGW says, I hear even major publishers have difficulty developing and maintaining in-house engines. So it is great that you are working on in-house development as a developer. Did you ever consider the option of using an engine made by another company. Takashi goes, it's true that maintaining an in-house engine is difficult, but for the titles we are in charge of developing, we don't currently have the option of using engines made by other companies. This is because in-house engines are easier to customize and suit our needs and are easier to use. Bingo, bango. This is why Nintendo likes to use in-house engines. Like, why isn't Nintendo using Unity all the time or Unreal Engine for everything? And it's because what Nintendo's trying to do with their games, it's actually easier if you custom create your own solutions to those problems than try to patch in solutions to problems that are only created by engines that weren't built for your technology. Bingo. Like, there's massive benefits. If you ever wonder why, like, Nintendo's games seem so bug-free and, and have uh, so little issues, it's because their engines are purpose-built for the hardware they're being used on. And with new hardware on the horizon and the Xenoblade team realizing our next games are probably coming on Nintendo's next platform, we need to overhaul now. Now is the time. There's a hardware transition. We have the means now. We can hire the people. We have the, the support and money from Nintendo. We need to actually take our engine to the next level for this new new system so we are ready to go and producing bigger and better games than we've ever made before so really this whole decision seems like it's all centered around the fact that hey there's new technology coming we need to be ready for it we need to custom build for that hardware right now and i'm, I'm really excited to see what this engine is going to do on the next xenoblade and as they note here they want this engine to be able to use on other monolith south projects so there's probably other games they're going to be working on that aren't using this engine that maybe could use it down the line uh, now, CGW says, I understand that you are mainly working on model rendering engine and the effect engine for the in-house game engine. Could you please tell us about uh, the development of each engine? So, Inaba says, for the modeling engine, we are working on five items. The module that outputs the model from the DCC tool, the implementation of materials, lighting, post effects, and seamless maps. For effects, we are implementing the runtime effect engine and development effect tools. For example, this is the screen of the effect engine we are developing in-house. We create the effect system with a node editor, but some designers are not good at nodes and want to create them based on properties, so we have a hybrid system that allows effects to be created from either nodes or properties. And this is really cool. What we're seeing here is an image of their actual engine uh, on the back, back end, right? Like, as you know, we don't see this stuff, you know, as gamers, right? We just play the game. But this is like the kind of stuff that 
developers are seeing on the back end when they're making assets and doing all this stuff. And this really reminds me, like I've made some games uh, when I was going to school for uh, programming for, you know, I was going to be a video game programmer at one point. That was one of the things I went for school for. Almost got my degree, but then I decided it wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> I know what a, what a waste of time uh, and money. But uh, when I was making games in Unity, there was something very similar to this. It didn't have these exact windows and these exact parameters, but uh, this is what game engines look like on the back end. This is what game development actually is. And I really enjoy that Monolith Soft is being so open to be like, hey, look, here's an image. We'll just give you an image for this interview of something that we're working on. Like this is obviously some lighting and particle effects over here on the left. Uh, you know, you're obviously seeing an asset here that's like a rock with some textures. I really like that uh, they're giving us this deep inside look at their engine and what the research and development team is doing. Uh, Nintendo, man, they're just being really transparent and they're allowing Monolith Soft, who is wholly owned by Nintendo, to just really open up about what it's like to make video games. Uh, this is an exciting interview. Uh, so then Anaba goes on to say, the development of the model output module is basically complete and we are currently working on lighting and materials to create visual expressions of characters and backgrounds specific to each title. CGW says, could you tell us more about the uh, second animation related research and development? So Anaba then goes, they we're currently working on animation uh, to the development of modular rings. So uh, using each these uh, using these each development section is creating rigs according to the title and animation using them. In addition, regarding simulation, for example, for hair movement, we are developing a module for secondary animation that bakes the simulations on DCC tools such as Houdini and reflects them at runtime. CGW comes in and says, as for the third tool for uh, development for designers, you are also working on the tool development for Houdini, Substance 3D Designer, Maya, etc. So these are being able to plug in outside resources into their engine. And Anaba says, uh, for example, Houdini, we are working on the development of simulation and procedural placement tools. In recent titles developments, we have created a mechanism to procedurally place background elements using Houdini. This has enabled us to effectively produce large amounts of background that would be impossible to achieve by hand. A task that would have taken 20 days can now be completed in just 30 minutes, which is a huge achievement. Again, this is part of streamlining development. Uh, we plan to continue strengthening this area. In the example shown here, all the background assets, including roads, are placed procedurally, and the dirt and grass maps uh, transition naturally near the roads. Although we can only show the wireframe in this example, a very natural transition has been achieved. Designers can now uh, quickly build complex backgrounds simply by setting the path curve for the road. And this is kind of cool. I don't know if this is from a current game or a game that's in development. And that's why they're like, hey, we're just going to show you the wire. We're not going to show you the mapping and, and, and the assets over the wire stuff. But uh, it, it's just kind of showing an example of how this all works. So this is like procedurally generated. Yes, guys, that does use a form of AI for that. But uh, it is really cool just to see how it's become much easier to do this than it used to be. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just really happy to have this kind of insight into Monolith stuff. And then it goes on and on and on to go over um, a, a couple of different things here towards the end. But uh, I think what I really get out of this entire interview is just how detail oriented, obviously, Monolith Soft is. That's not shouldn't be surprising. They're one of Nintendo's greatest development companies like this. This, this isn't surprising you know, how detail-oriented they have to be. I mean, they're helping make Zelda possible. They're obviously making Xenoblade possible. They have a new IP in development. Uh, they got a lot going on, and I'm just really happy to hear that they finally have the means and the money and the support from Nintendo within to just create a research and development team to bring everything fully in-house, get this engine fully up-to-date, ready to go for Switch 2, ready to streamline everything, and ready to get more and more games out for us during the Switch 2 era. I'm really excited about what's happening at Monolith Soft. I hope you're excited as well, because again, it's one of my favorite development studios Nintendo has under their wings. And who knows? Maybe they have a new, brand new IP action adventure game ready to go for us in the future. We'll have to wait and see. Otherwise, we know there'll be more Xenoblade, right? They're not just going to stop making Xenoblade, are they? Will they call it Xenoblade Chronicles 4 or Riska's 3, the end of an arc? They now get to go in a different direction. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I'll catch all of you guys in that next video.